These banks and stones to each side of the road here in Addington, near Maidstone in Kent, are a Neolithic long barrow, about 5,000 years old. The road was cut through the mound in the 19th century. There are many such communal tombs all over Britain, but this one has a special significance, as, it, as it's a point on the lay we call the E-line. This is the widest and most powerful lay yet found, running from across the country from Cape Cornwall to Laysdown on the Isle of Sheppey. The width of the E-line is usually about a hundred paces, and Eileen Roche doused it a little to the west near Sevenoaks in 1992. And I won't go any faster. I can feel it starting to come. Yes. I can, I can, I can, I can feel it. Road moving, yes. Carry on, just carry on driving. We watch the road. Okay. We're approaching the bridge. Yes, the road is moving slowly. Now it's moving over, moving. Now I can feel it. That's where I felt it before. It's not moved any further. It's, there it is now. It's almost moved back now. Okay. You're over it rather quickly over the peak. Back now. Right. And I'm going to pull in here because there's a car behind me. I'm going to get a bit of a fright. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent! There's also a clump of Scots pines adjacent to the barrow. Alfred Watkins and Tony Wedd found these often occurred on lays. As well as this, the barrow is a lay centre, a meeting place of lays, and another through it links Addington Church and Trosley Church to the north. St Margaret's Addington. There's a large stone in the wall of this church, which could be from the barrow, or it could be from this site as well. From the church, the lay runs along this path at the Seekers Trust, a prayer and spiritual healing organisation. It then runs across the Rose Garden, which is in the form of a seven-point star, which was also the badge of Tony Wedd's Star Fellowship. The garden and the adjoining library of the Trust seem to have a very similar atmosphere to the upper room at Chalice Well in Glastonbury. There seems to be a mound where the Addington to Trosley Church lay crosses the road. Trosley Church is on another lay, found by Paul Deverer, former editor of the Lay Hunter magazine and featured with him in the TV programme The Strange Affair of the Old Straight Track in 1986. The lay goes through the Coldrum Long Barrow and several churches to the east. Several stones visible at the base of the church have been thought to be possibly sarsen stones preceding the church. Stones near Bramble Park in Trosley. I should say chamber barrow. Um, it's a classic example of medway type of chamber tomb. Um, it's excavated in 1910 uh, by Sir Arthur Keith and it was found to have 22 skeletons here, plus uh, some infants. Um, one of the skulls was obviously um, accorded a lot more importance than the other, and was um, put on a little shelf of its own, so imagine a, a chieftain or somebody accorded that kind of respect. Uh, it did have a dividing stone in the middle, a sexual stone, and um, there was a semicircular hole going between the, the two, so a sort of porthole between the two. Um, there was also a flint sickle found and some uh, rather crude pottery. Um, most of them, the remains are in the Maidstone um, Museum. If you want to find it. Um, this stone circle you see round it, um, called the Perry Stale, um, was basically a retaining wall. And uh, the mound was 
approximately D-shaped as you can see it now. Um, if you look down here, you can see the other half of the chamber, which unfortunately slid down the slope. And the reason for this was because of a chalk quarrying the early part of last century. Um, there was a natural terrace here, so this was, was on a good lookout here. It dropped down naturally, but unfortunately they've eroded away and it slid down the slope there. Um, it's mainly more or less covered over with earth. It was a very good lookout. The main axis, as you can see, is um, east-west, which was um, quite a classic alignment. It's about three and a half miles. Um, that's where the lay ends up. So it goes through here, goes through a pond, goes to Snodden Church, uh, the, uh, the way across the river there, there's the falls out, and it goes on to Bareham Falls. Yes. And there was a legend of a tunnel to That's the church. Right. The tunnel runs, well, the, 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 the legend says it runs from the Mountain Barrow over to the church. And um, you want me to go through the... Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Well, the story is that um, two brothers heard about this and wanted to test where the tunnel might lead to. And um, so they decided the best way to do it, one of them was to walk along the top, and one of them was to actually go along the tunnel. So the, the brother who went through the tunnel played his pipe, and his brother above him was able to locate him below by following along the top. But unfortunately, he got about halfway, and all of a sudden the uh, piping stopped. Unfortunately, the brother was never found. So that's a sort of sad end to it. Um, probably um, shows you that uh, you know it was more of a legend than a tunnel itself, because there seems to be no entrance. To it. But um, as you know. These tunnel, tunnel legends that we usually call on, on the ley lines. So because it's so wide, the E line takes in this, this tomb at the Chestnuts, as well as the Addington Barrow nearby. And this, of course, was the great revolution of existence. A man is going to start using his environment say instead of just accepting what's there and being a hunter-gatherer, people uh, were looking at ways that they could um, utilise the land better. So when they came to the Medway Valley there was everything that they wanted. There were the North Downs about a mile away that gave them a place for fire or, or refuge. Um, and, and of course if flooding came then that was a good place to be. There was the Weald of Kent that gave them wood and animals. That came much closer than it does today. There was the river with all its tributaries and that gave them the agricultural land that they wanted. Not marked on here but on the south side of the hills, uh, a route that we call the Pilgrim's Way. One of the great prehistoric tracks through the landscape, only called the Pilgrim's Way after it was used by the, murder, uh, by the pilgrims who were going to Canterbury after the murder of Thomas a Becket in 1170. So they came into the area and got settled and then somewhere around 3750 BC, and the dates are very tenuous, the tombs were put up. And it's interesting to me because when I first came in the 60s, they just gave a blanket time of about 2000 BC for all the tombs. So in the time I've been here, they, they've been able to um, redefine that, and we now know this early, middle and late Neolithic. I must remind you that what we think of as Stonehenge is late Neolithic. The, the stones go up about 2000 BC because that was a site that was evolving over a period of time. Here in the valley of course it's early Neolithic, about 3700 BC. But I expect those dates to change because I, I keep reading, every time I read this somebody's got a different idea about it all. Well the stone itself is Sarsen and I'm told that they um, do, these, these types of stones do occur um, in various places, particularly in sandy areas. So when they were looking for stones, they not only had to find stones that were relative in size to one another, but they had to have a flat base. They're just going to be brought here and upended. Really a very primitive sort of way of building something, really. By the time Stonehenge comes, they are realising that you need to dig through little pits to make the stones stable. They're also using the mortise and tenon effect across the top to link the capstones in. And they are shifting stones between 40 and 45 tonnes in weight, whereas here in the valley they are generally between 5 and 15 tonnes individually. 
my, my largest stone appears to be about 14 tons, but I'll show you that in a moment. There's also some thought that at that time they were using symbolic shapes. Alexander Keeler, who had the Avery site, realised that he was looking at stones that either were or had been triangles or rectangles. And certainly here, the, you'll notice the outside ones of the facade, the, uh, the front line of stones, were definitely triangular. They haven't been damaged in any way. And of course, the, the central stone gives on to the chamber. They're known as chamber tombs, they're not underground tombs. I really ought to show you the, um, the plan that the archaeologists give us as being the original. We are standing about here. So behind us there are the five big stones of the facade. One, two, three, four, five. Giving on to the central chamber. The two stones that made the capstones are over at the back and I'll show you those in a moment. What's missing is the great mound of soil that went over it and stretched away to the west. And we've lost all sight of how far that goes back. Every so often the archaeologists come and have a dig around in a little bit of woodland there, but they've never really been able to decide exactly how far it went back. Quite a different shape to the long barrow on the road. There's another lay through the Addington Barrow, which goes through the church in Chiddingston, Tony Wedd's village. I previously doused this as a wide band of energy going diagonally across it several years ago. The light goes through the motorway bridge at Addington and douses at 30 paces wide. line was first discovered by Eileen Roche and Gordon Millington. They were visiting Pitch Hill in Surrey where there had been a quite a spectacular UFO sighting and doused a very wide band of energy crossing the hill. In the succeeding months they found this was a lay crossing the country and its most easterly point was lays down on sea on the Isle of Sheppey. They tracked it across many points throughout Surrey and then found that it went through the Cern Abbas Giant in Dorset. The E-line that the Surrey Earth Mysteries Group have been following across Surrey and Kent goes through the chalk figure of the giant near Cern Abbas when extended westwards. We found the line as wide and powerful as usual, much wider than this line superimposed on the aerial photograph plotted by Eileen, which represents its centre. Note, however, that it runs along a field boundary and skirts the Trendle earthwork. The real line would take in the whole of the Trendle. The other line is one found by Paul Devereux, illustrated in The Lay Hunter's Companion and The Lay Guide. This is the E line at Churn Abbas. If you follow me down, you can see the figure of the giant long man on the hillside. The lay then crosses Devon and Cornwall to leave the coast here at Cape Cornwall. We've never found any lay as wide and powerful as this one. <laughs> 